Hi students, thank you for joining Maxine and I for another read along of her latest adventure, Maxine and the Old Horse Theater. We are on chapter three and to, just to recap a little bit, Maxine in the first chapter was sent to the principal's office for doodling an unflattering sketch of her music arts teacher. And on the way, while looking out the window, she saw a horse, a carriage horse in distress and ran outside to try to help extricate his wheel from the slat of a bike rack. When she did that, she looked into the carriage and saw there was a hat and it seemed like it had kind of magical tendencies allowing her to maybe communicate with the horse. Next thing you know, she jumped into the carriage and the horse got spooked and took off. So let's dig in to the next part of her adventure. Chapter three, Rico and Rosa. As the horse charges ahead, Maxine screams, whoa, Caesar, stop. Hey! She rises to her knees, her brown knuckles pale from the effort of holding on. Did you hear me? I said you can stop now. Her command turns into a whimper. P please Her voice slides up an octave and ends in a wobbly screech. Desperate, she grabs the blanket from the driver's perch in front and throws it forward. The fuzzy edge brushes the horse's flank. Unfortunately, the gray wool catches the wind and whips right back into her face. Instead of slowing the horse, she has just scared him into a full gallop. Whoa, boy, whoa! Somebody get me out of here, she yelps. Terrified, she collapses in a heap under the prickly weight of the blanket. If only I'd gone straight to the principal's office like I was supposed to, she wails. Anything's better than being dead on arrival. Finding it hard to breathe through the thick wool, she struggles to rise to her knees again. With her left elbow around the coach's dash rail for balance, she uses her other hand to escape the blanket. After the musty wool, the brisk air feels good. She gulps the fine icy mix as her grateful lungs expand. Breathe. Stay calm and breathe. Suddenly, the horse fears right. The coach lurches, defying gravity as it rises dangerously on two right wheels. Maxine can hear the scrape of one damaged wheel on the asphalt. With the blood-curdling yelp, she slides to the right, banging her elbow. I guess you only understand me when I wear the hat, she screams at the horse. She stretches one arm toward the black hat and quickly grabs it by the brim. The horse pays no attention. Instead, he continues his frantic gallop down the deserted street. It takes only a second to jam the hat back over her braids. She holds on to the hat with one hand and screeches, Stop! Can you hear me? I said stop! At last, Caesar slows down. His hooves crunch and the carriage wheels roll on what now sounds like dirt and gravel. The horse brays and slows to a walk. She dares to peer over the rail just as someone shouts, Whoa, amigo! Caesar whinnies louder as Maxine tries to stand. She hangs onto the cold brass rail and stares as a lanky boy about her age runs toward the horse. His topaz-flecked eyes flash with determination as he fearlessly leaps into Caesar's path. Maxine watches her heart catching in her throat. There is a slow-motion battle between boy and beast for what seems like a long minute. The horse plunges forward, but the strange boy refuses to back down. At the last second, he reaches in to grab the loose leather reins. She marvels at how he expertly sidesteps Caesar's powerful hooves. The stranger then leans away from the horse, pulling the reins taut. Hola, que pasa? What's up? He asks the horse. The boy is careful to hold onto the reins tightly. 
Using both feet to break, he drags his scuffed leather boots through the dirt and gravel. His dark eyes sparkle as he takes control of the wild horse. Why the hurry, mi amigo? He makes an odd clicking noise with his tongue and the horse lowers his head, snorts, and finally stops. Maxine hangs over the brass rail, grateful the carriage is at last still. They both watch Caesar, steam clouds rising from his nostrils and around his head. The boy gives Maxine a triumphant grin. She barely has time to notice his gleaming teeth and high tan cheekbones as a sudden gust of wind tosses his jet black hair across his face. With an impatient hand, he sweeps the wavy locks away and stares at her. His name's Caesar, she offers. Says right there, see? Maxine points to the brass plaque on the white surrey. Thanks for putting the brakes on him. Good thing, because I thought we wouldn't stop till Canada. The boy shrugs and nods. Donata, it's nothing. A shy silence grows between them as they gaze at the horse. Caesar's head hangs low and his great chest heaves, with each breath growing slower. Frosty air swirls from his velveteen nostrils. The boy wraps the reins tight around his hand and leans near the horse. Maxine hears him murmur softly, Está bien, that's good. Take your time, amigo. You are safe here. Curious about the boy, her eyes dart around the courtyard. What is this place? The gravel path leads to several brick and stone outbuildings with huge arched openings. The architecture looks solid and old fashioned. Nothing like the skyscraper she is used to seeing in her city loop neighborhood. Bales of straw are piled to one side and there are droppings of manure scattered throughout the well-trod dirt portion of the path. She is startled when the boy calmly walks Caesar across the adjoining yard to a long metal trough near the central arch. The horse whinnies in appreciation. That's definitely thanks and horse talk, Maxine offers. Caesar lowers his head and slurps water with his long, dark tongue. Without warning, the stranger whirls around. He shakes his fist at her and his eyes flash. Why treat a horse this way, he asks in halting English. He's scared and so thirsty. He jerks his thumb at the water trough before pointing to a jagged scar on the horse's right flank. She watches as he examines it carefully. Finally, he bends down on one knee to take a closer look at Caesar's worn gray hooves. Above him, the horse shifts nervously. With a deep frown, the boy rises, hands on his hips. You do this to him for the money? He glares at her. His anger catches her by surprise. Huh? What do you mean? She blusters. I tried to help. It's not my fault he went crazy. Something scared him. To make her point, she leaps from the carriage, but her dark tangle of braids bounce free when the tall silk hat falls backward, landing on the floor of the carriage. It is quickly forgotten as Maxine's nose curls in dismay. Ooh. She's landed inches away from a pile of fresh horse droppings on the ground. She teeters dangerously on one foot before doing a short bunny hop away from the mess. Grateful to be back on clean, solid ground, she stands tall and straight, ignoring the strange boy's stare. He steps toward the thirsty horse, his voice rising to accuse her again. See, he is scared for his life. Cars, buses, motorcycles, ambulances. For a horse in the city, a smallo, it's bad. Noise, smoke in his face all day. He strokes Caesar and shakes his head. A deep frown wrinkles his forehead and hardens his eyes. This horse has lost his soul. It was stolen from him. And for what? The angry boy points to the scar on Caesar's flank and glares at her. Dinero, he hisses. Money. Maxine's face burns as she sputters. 
But everyone loves carriage rides, especially on Michigan Avenue. The tourists always take pictures. Besides, my dad says it's good for business when... Bah! Tourists. Business. Maxine is shocked when the boy steps close and pokes her in the arm. You make this horse a slave for tourists? His voice cracks like a whip. Steal his soul for business? He slices one hand through the air as if ending the idea and their conversation once and for all. His eyes narrow as he points a finger at her. You do not deserve this horse. You think I? Wait, me? Own a horse? Now you're the crazy one. You calling me loco, he sneers. The only crazy is you with this horse. A horse that breaks his back all day on city streets. And what is his reward? The boy's eyes flash amber sparks again. Maxine is mad enough to kick horse poop at this rude kid accusing her of horse abuse, but that would ruin her shoes. Instead, she straightens her shoulders and sticks her chin out, hands on her hips. No way, not me. For such a know-it-all, you don't know anything, do you? She sneers, but her voice wobbles just a bit. Why does this always happen around boys just when you need to prove a point? She fumes, breathe. She fills her lungs, the icy air giving her confidence. Hey, news flash, he's not my horse, get it? The boy shakes his head and points at her head. You forget the hat, I saw it, you are the driver. He stares her down. To her credit, she blinks several times before looking away. No way, I tell him about the magic hat. He thinks he knows so much about horses. Well, I can talk to them. So, the boy interrupts her private thoughts. What do you say, newsflash, know it all? Her eyes slide toward the carriage as she ignores his smug jeer. Ha, I'll show him. Before he can stop her, she climbs halfway up into the carriage. The black top hat is trapped between the seat bench and her red canvas backpack. She leans forward and reaches for the backpack, easily slinging the strap over her shoulder. Then she grabs the hat and jumps back down to the ground. With an exaggerated sweep of the hat to the top of her head, she gives a defiant smirk. The hat drops over her braids. She lets the hat sink low on her forehead, not bothering to tuck away her braids. She squints at him from beneath the brim. See, it doesn't fit, cause it's not mine. I was just uh, trying it out. Before that, I was only trying to help a runaway horse. Nobody was even in the carriage, so there. She resists the urge to stick out her tongue at him. The slim stranger frowns and points. Then you helped yourself to someone else's horse, he crows. What? You mean, like, stole him? She gasps. Why would I steal a horse? We live in a condo. For once, the boy looks uncertain. Condo? Yeah, she points above her head. You know, high rise in the sky, 57 flights of stairs. Now that would be animal abuse. They don't even let dogs on the lobby elevators in my building. They have to take the freight elevator instead. And I don't think that's big enough for him. She points at the horse, unable to hold back a grin. Just thinking about Caesar riding in her building's freight elevator up to meet her shocked parents makes her giggle. She claps a hand over her mouth, nearly giving herself the hiccups. The boy suddenly smiles back, revealing two perfect dimples in his cheeks. He's kind of cute when he smiles. She is immediately annoyed with herself for thinking such a silly thing and fights the urge to blush. The two of them look at Caesar. Glancing from the horse to each other, they both start to laugh. Floor 21, please, Maxine requests as she steps forward. This time, she is careful not to step in a manure pile. She pretends to push an elevator button. After you, please. She sweeps her arm toward the horse. The strange boy laughs louder. 
He drops the reins, but Caesar suddenly rears up, his front legs pawing the air above him. Look out, Maxine shrieks. She jumps backward as the horse slams his front hooves back to the ground. He shakes his head and bares his teeth before giving a loud whinny. Geez, we were just kidding, Caesar. Nobody meant to make fun of you. She clutches the hat to her head as her stomach lurches half-digested fish sticks. Hey, any chance he might be hungry? Whoa, whoa. Again, the boy makes several soothing chirps and quickly grabs the reins. He pulls the leather straps taut and pats the horse on the flank. Good boy, we go inside. Maybe she does know something about horses, huh? You want to eat, amigo? With the flick of the reins and more strange clicks of his tongue, the ho young horseman leads Caesar toward one of the stone archways. You coming, high rise? The boy turns to her and waits. An impish grin again makes two perfect dimples in his tan cheeks. Maxine gives a nonchalant shrug before whipping the hat from her head and striding after them. She keeps a close eye on Caesar's hooves as she walks, unzipping her backpack and stuffing the hat inside. So I'm right, huh? He's hungry, she confirms, trying not to sound too smug. The boy's long fingers brush Caesar's flank as the trio reaches the nearest stone archway. Horses are always hungry. Todo el tiempo, all the time. The stranger's laugh catches in his throat. He looks at her as though she just asked the dumbest question in the world. She tries not to notice. How come you know so much about horses? What's your name anyway? They step into the shadow of the arched entrance. Once inside, Maxine is surprised to see a towering stack of hay bales in one corner of the slightly warmer interior. Is this a barn in the middle of the city? How come you ask so many questions, High Rise? He doesn't give her a chance to answer. Not just a barn. This is the historic Old Horse Theater of Chicago. The boy bows low from the waist, arms outstretched as if welcoming her to a grand palace. A place that respects horses, he adds, for being the smartest and noblest animals on earth. Again, he can't quite hide his smirk. He leads Caesar to a nearby trough filled with golden grain. The horse ducks his head, eager to eat. From the far corner, there is a gentle whinny. Maxine turns to see several other horses eyeing them through the wooden slats in a long row of closed stall doors. Caesar's ears prick in their direction, but he continues to eat. The horse munches as flecks of grain catch on his whiskers and velvet nose. Eager to know more, she thrusts out her hand. My name's Maxine, actually. That's with an X, Z, and Y, she adds. X, Z, and Y? The boy ignores her hand and looks at her curiously. Yeah, just think of all the Scrabble points you get spelling my name, probably enough to win the game. Self-conscious again, she lets her hand drop back to her side. You always talk so much, High Rise, or Max, with an X, Z, and Y? His eyebrows rise in amusement. Only when I'm not sure who I'm talking to, she retorts. I mean, maybe if you told me your name. She sticks out her chin and waits. Perdon, me llamo Rico. His name rolls off his tongue, sounding a bit exotic. With a graceful flourish, he transfers Caesar's reins to his left hand and offers her a calloused right hand. Pleased with his polite gesture, she grins. His firm grip is warm as he briefly clasps her pencil-smudged fingers. So, what is your plan with this horse? He jerks his head at Caesar, who contentedly munches beside him. You will not ride him to your condo, huh? She ignores his tease about the condo. Suddenly nervous, her words tumble out in a rush. 
well, I, I figure if I can find his owner, do something positive, then maybe I wouldn't be in so much trouble. Uh, that is, after getting kicked out of class for drawing Miss Garrett. She pauses, not liking how that sounded. Well, Miss Garrett's my music teacher, see? And it wasn't really my fault. She flaps her arms dramatically. I mean, I was bored, so I just started doodling this cartoon, and the other kids took it, and hey, she stomps her foot and her hazel eyes flash. Why are you laughing? She frowns and stands tall, resting both hands on her hips. You sure got a lot of words in you, high rise. Rico shakes his head. He doesn't smile, but his eyes twinkle. Maxine bristles. Well, at least I tried to do something. I mean, I got the horse here, didn't I? She tosses her braids away from her face, daring him to make fun of her again true. He nods, too polite to remind her that he was the one who actually stopped the runaway horse and carriage. But who is the owner? Where do we find him? Beside him, Caesar lifts his head from the feed trough and whinnies. His head rolls from either side of his powerful neck as if he disagreed with these particular questions. From behind one of the stall doors, there is an answering whinny. Caesar doesn't sound very positive about that plan, she thinks. Rico rubs Caesar's long snout. The owner does not deserve this horse. The boy scowls and his eyes flash dangerously. El Caballo can't be trusted on the streets when there is so much stress in him. He walks behind Caesar, but this time remembers to make a few reassuring clicks of his tongue. Is that some sort of horse code, Maxine wonders? She watches as he easily unfastens the carriage tethered to the horse's carriage lines. Uh, we? Her voice rises. When did my rescue mission become we? So far, all you've done is water and feed him. Oh, so you know Caballos and don't need any help. Rico shrugs at her. He doesn't wait for an answer, but tugs the reins. She follows as he leads Caesar to the row of stall doors. The young horseman jerks his thumb back toward Maxine. What do you think of that, Caesar? Now curious about the other horses in the stalls, Caesar eagerly follows the boy's lead. Maxine must lengthen her stride to keep up. Well, um, no, probably not enough to... I mean, if you want to help, that's great, but, well, okay, it's cool. Besides, what if we don't find the owner? He doesn't answer. She catches up to them and waits as he opens an empty stall door. The boy gently ushers Caesar inside. With a firm hand, he strokes the horse's back. This motion seems to calm Caesar as he snuffles and turns, finally settling comfortably in his new space. Maxine continues her train of thought. Yeah, why not? Maybe we'll just save the horse. Rico steps outside the stall door. He gives a final reassuring tongue click to Caesar and closes the door. He smiles through the slats. You are safe here, amigo. He glances into the adjoining stall. Lady Pearl will keep you company. See, Princessa? His grin widens as he waves several fingers at a platinum mare sporting a thick golden mane. Maxine peers through the slats and admires the beautiful horse. All Lady Pearl needs is a long horn and she'd be a unicorn from the storybooks I used to draw. As if reading her thoughts, the horse shuffles closer. Lady Pearl blinks one gray eye with long golden lashes observing the young girl through the slats. From the other side of the long row of stalls comes a high-pitched whistle. Rico looks over his shoulder, his face tense, but relaxes when a pretty girl with a smile just like his own strides toward them. Maxine stares at her. She secretly admires the other girl's shiny dark hair as it falls over a tan turtleneck and brown leather riding jacket. Her knee-high boots are a soft black and perfectly flat. She carries a riding crop in her slim brown hand. Where have you been, Rico? Her voice is smooth and accented. She looks at Maxine curiously. 
And who is she? Maxine steps forward. Hi, my name's Maxine. She feels very out of place in her school uniform, but extends her hand to the girl. With an X, Z, and Y, Rico adds, again trying not to smile. Maxine rolls her eyes in annoyance. Why do boys always have to make fun of girls every chance they get? This is Rosa, my sister, he shrugs nonchalantly. The pretty girl accepts Maxine's handshake and wrinkles her nose at her brother. See, your older twin sister was sent to find you. You are late for practice. She drops Maxine's hand, turning serious. Now Mr. Stryker is upset. What are you doing out here? What is she doing here? Rosa glances at the school crest on Maxine's polo shirt. She points to the light suede school shoes. Those shoes won't be clean for long, not in here. Forget her shoes, help me with this carriage. Rico races down the dim row of stalls. He motions to the two girls. Quick, we must hide it. They race after him and skid to a stop just as Rico pulls a long gray tarp from a hook high on a worn wooden post. The canvas cloth falls to the ground, raising a cloud of fine golden straw bits around them. Ah, choo! Maxine sneezes when the dust cloud reaches her nose. Rico ignores her sneeze. Rapido, hurry! He drags the tarp to the white carriage abandoned earlier near the feed trough. Where did you get this carriage? Rosa demands. She frowns when he doesn't answer. He unfurls the tarp and each girl grabs a corner of the canvas, lifting it. Rico jumps inside the carriage and reaches for it. You'll get us in trouble, Rico, his twin scolds. Mr. Stryker won't like it. You know we can't lose this job. Who's Mr. Stryker? Puzzled, Maxine looks from one twin to the other. Do you work here? Not for long, Rosa snaps. She jerks her edge of the canvas tarp and straightens it over the carriage. He'll get us fired. She glares at her brother for being late to practice and bringing something that does not belong here. Trouble! She stands with both hands on her hips, daring him to respond. Rico does not look at her. Instead, he leaps from the far side of the carriage, neatly pulling the tarp down around the carriage wheels. Get a few bales of hay to put in front here and nobody will see it, he insists. His twin sister stands firm. Rico gives an exaggerated sigh. Rosa, it's mi problema, not yours. We are twins, Armanito. What you do hurts me too, she hisses back. And what about her? Rosa jerks her thumb at Maxine. He shrugs. She found the horse. Now he is safe. Rosa is dismayed. Horse? Just help her hide under the carriage while we practice. He gives Maxine a strained smile. Okay, high rise? One minute. Horse, what horse, Rico? Rosa slaps the canvas cloth with her riding crop. Rico shakes his head. Later, Ermanita. He pulls up an edge of the tarp and impatiently points under the carriage, waiting for Maxine. She frowns and backs away, one hand clutching her backpack. Uh... Let me get this straight. You want me to wait here while you go practice what exactly? Her shoulders sag when he nods. See, si, rapido. She rolls her eyes, slowly crawls past the hay bales and ducks under the tarp. Don't know why I can't just go with you and stay there, he orders. I'll come get you. As an afterthought, he pushes the gray blanket under the carriage. Maxine sits cross-legged on the cold stone floor. The twins' feet recede from view as they walk away. She watches Rosa kick a small pile of straw at her brother. Are you crazy, Rosa hisses. You brought a strange horse and this girl to the old horse theater? Cielos! Our family will lose this job, Rico. Our paychecks, everything. 
Both twins' boots disappear and their voices grow faint. Relax, Rico urges. Of course, I will take care of it. I promise. Come on, we are late. Still bickering, they walk down the long row of stalls toward another set of high arches. Seconds later, from the far end of the building, a door squeaks on ancient metal hinges and closes behind them. Maxine sighs, grateful for the rustling, munching, and shuffling sounds of horses in their stalls nearby. In the shadowy gloom of the stable, she anxiously waits for Rico's return. That's the end of chapter three. And if we go here to the back of the book, we find some discussion questions. So, the first one is, the carriage drivers use horses to drive tourists around to earn a living. What do you think of animals being used by humans to earn money? Can it be done fairly and humanely? And who should set the rules governing the use of animals as laborers? Business people? Farm workers? Animal rights advocates? School children? What punishment should people get for breaking the rules protecting animals? Rico and Maxine get off to a bad start. He first accuses her of mistreating the horse and later accuses her of stealing it. She considers him strange and rude and calls him a know-it-all. Why do you think there's tension between them? Rico unfairly assumed that Maxine was the owner of the horse and yelled at her for mistreating the animal. Think of an example of when you jumped to a conclusion or made an assumption but were wrong. What would you do differently the next time? What can happen when you make false assumptions about people and their motives? How does it feel when they make false assumptions about you? When Maxine pretends she and Rico are taking Caesar on the freight elevator in her condo, the tension between the two of them starts to ease. Can you think of a time when humor helped to calm down a tense situation? Why do you think Maxine was reluctant at first to accept Rico's offer to help find the horse's owner? Do you think she could have saved the horse by herself? Do you think she wanted to? Who comes up with a plan on how to save the horse? How do Maxine and Rico, after bickering, decide to work together to find the horse's owner? Why do you think Rosa calls Rico Ermanito, little brother, when they are actually twins? Maxine agrees to hide under the carriage in the stable while Rico and Rosa go to practice their act. Should she have waited under the tarp for Rico to return? What choices did she have then? So that ends chapter three, read along, and we thank you for joining us. Stay tuned for chapter four. And just remember that if you have any questions that you might want to ask me about the book, Maxine, um, being an author, writing, reading, you can check out the website maxine.com and with your parents' permission, of course, shoot me an email, ask me a question, I'll be happy to answer it. So tune in for chapter four. Thanks for joining us.